So today is April the 22nd, 2018. My name is Scott Powers, and I'm a professor at the University of Florida. And I'm at the San Diego Convention Center at the annual meeting of the American Physiological Society. It's my distinct honor and pleasure today to have a chance to have a conversation and interview Dr. Kenneth Baldwin for the Society's Living History Project. Dr. Baldwin's been a long-standing member of the American Physiological Society and has been a faculty member at the University of California at Irvine since 1973. So, Ken, welcome to the Living History Project. It's a pleasure to be with you today. And I'd like to have a chance to, when you're prepared, to ask you some questions about your career. Thank you. I'm happy to have you asking me these questions because you're my man. Yeah. So let's begin with a, a question about your background. Tell me a little bit about your upbringing, your parents' professions, and how you became interested in science. Well, I was born on April the 25th, 1942, in Lemonster, Massachusetts, which is about 35 miles west of Boston. My parents were George and Mary Bedard Baldwin. My father and mother were English, Welsh, and French, respectively. My dad was from a big family with a lot of sisters and a lot of brothers. And my uh, family was a blue collar. Uh, the one thing that is important is that Lemonster at that time was called the Plastic City. And that's where uh, Foster Grants uh, settled in. If you uh, like uh, glasses and things of that, that's where my father uh, uh, after he got out of the, uh, the Navy, uh, uh, he went to work at, at there all his life there. And my wife, my mother also worked uh, to help us uh, as we, uh, we as, as I was growing up. Uh, Lemister, I, I, I'm proud of it because it was, uh, has a passion for sports. And uh, Lemister was known uh, to be a, uh, in the high school, it was one of the best in uh, central Massachusetts. And uh, in my early years, I started to uh, play basketball, football, and baseball and so forth. And then when I got into high school, I was in my uh, years there, I was uh, basically uh, playing football, basketball, and baseball. And uh, I really excelled there. And it was at that time that I uh, wanted to uh, become a uh, become a physical education teacher. And I also had a dream to be the coach of the Celtics. But I never got there. Uh, my um, family didn't have a lot of money. And um, my parents wanted me to join the Navy because my father was uh, in the Navy in World War II, and he was there when I was born, and he didn't see me until I was two years old. So uh, I finally went out, and they said, we will do our best to help you. And I uh, was accepted, accepted to Springfield College, so I a lot, I owe a lot to my family that uh, really helped me along the way, and, and they weren't rich at all. And so, uh, once I got to uh, Springfield, then I started to move forward. 
So in regard to Springfield, let's shift our conversation now. And I'd like to ask you about, you received your bachelor's degree from Springfield and a master's from the University of Massachusetts. At that time in your career, what were you thinking that you were going to do going forward? Well, as I said just a minute ago, uh, I loved playing sports in my early years and was lucky enough to go to uh, Springfield College. And I knew uh, it was pricey there. It was a private school. And the day after I graduated from high school, I started working in a paper mill in Fitchburg, Fitchburg. Lemonster and Fitchburg are Muff and Jeff. And uh, the, 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 the thing about uh, the two towns is that on Thanksgiving, they would have the, their, uh, their football at, on Thanksgiving. And they have the longest rivalry in the country mm -hmm. except for Boston English and Boston Latin. That's how long that they've been playing against each other. Yeah. And Lemester has won out most of them. Thanks. So my uncle got me a job at this one of the, uh, the uh, where is it now? It's uh, uh, in the f in, in a factory, a paper mill. And I worked there every uh, summer before I went to Springfield. And then in my four years, I uh, worked there too to uh, pay so that uh, at the end of the day, I never had to take out loans and all that mm -hmm. when I was at uh, Springfield. So uh, uh, I think uh, we teamed up and did well. So when I got into uh, Springfield, in my junior year, I had to take exercise physiology, which was uh, 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 under Dr. Charles M. Tipton. And he uh, taught exercise sciences. And at that time, uh, he was working under Dr. Peter Karpovich, who was one of the big guns in the exercise sciences worldwide at that time. It turned out that I aced Tipton's rigorous course, and he invited me to join him in his studies of exercise. It was at that time I knew I wanted to go in my future into the sciences. However, when I returned to uh, Springfield in my senior year, I learned that Dr. Tipton was recruited to the University of Iowa in Iowa City to put together an exercise physiology to uh, put that university on the map. Therefore, I started looking for good schools in the east, on the East Coast, and I found that uh, the University of Massachusetts in, in Amherst, which is close to Springfield, was putting together an exercise program there. I learned that one of the professors running the program was Dr. Benjamin uh, Ben Ritchie, who was a graduate from Springfield College in the class of 1948, Tipton, uh, was uh, in 1952. So I called him about the program, and shortly I was offered a scholarship for my master's degree. And uh, at that time, uh, I was recruited by Dr. Ritchie, and he uh, studied potential mechanisms at that time, enabling athletes to increase their maximum oxygen input 
and their oxygen debts. And I, look, I started that and I got my master's degree uh, studying that, those uh, subjects and so forth. From there, I uh, started uh, thinking about wh what, what do I really want to do because I knew uh, Tipton was there and I, I needed s some uh, framework once I got my master's. So I uh, learned that at Keene State College in New Hampshire, one of the professors was taking a year's sabbatical to Springfield to polish up his research when I contacted the people at Keene State, I got the, the, the job based on my background in exercise as an academic ex instructor at Keene State. I was very busy there in exercise physiology, human health, and skill techniques. And I was also filling in for the head coach varsity men's t tennis team I never played tennis, but I had a skill set with it. And uh, I studied, and uh, long story short, we won the uh, New England uh, uh, championship. So I thought I did a, a pretty good job. While at Keene State, I contacted Dr. Tipton at the University of Iowa concerning my chances being accepted into his exercise program. He told me that in order to get into his program, I needed a background in the following topics. Mathematics up to statistics and calculus, chemistry up through organic chemistry and a foreign language. I chose French because of my mother. I was very lucky as the dean of the uh, exercise science program at that time. Uh, one of his faculty was uh, running the uh, an, an atomically laboratory. I took that job and then I taught there in uh, at that time, and I got all of my prerequisites to get to uh, Iowa. And so uh, the rest is history in terms of uh, getting into the Tipton program. And there might be another uh, question about that, uh, about uh, what's going on at the... So with that intro, let's move to Iowa City and your PhD program at the University right. of Iowa. Tell me about how Dr. Tipton influenced your career during your graduate studies. Well, Tipton was a man that basically felt that people that get into the exercise science programs are almost as good as doctors. And basically, the prerequisites was what a, a med student would be. And when he put his uh, program together, we went with the, the, the medical people because we were taking medical physiology, biochemistry, endocrinology, molecular biology, and exercise ph physiology theory and laboratory techniques, to name a few. Dr. Tipton did not help us select our research project for the PhD. To my knowledge, over 45 years, very few professors let the students take on his or her projects. And I was very happy for that because at that time, in our studies of exercise, of exercise physiology, I learned that the skeletal muscle system is made up of many types of muscle fibers, fast, slow, intermediate, and no one in the program was interested in the skeletal, skeletal muscle system except me. Therefore, I did my uh, research on work in metabolic patterns of fast and slow twitch skeletal muscle 
contracting in situ. And uh, I did a good job with that. Uh, and I earned my uh, PhD and I got a paper out of it. So I'm very happy uh, in those days. And uh, the, therefore, my studies under the wisdom of uh, Dr. Tipton became the catalyst for me studying me me mechanistic studies of the skeletal and cardiac muscle throughout my postdoc studies under uh, Dr. John Halazi at Washington University. And uh, Tip gave me, uh, told me that he talked to uh, Halazi and he says, I'm one of the best of his products. And that's how I got the job to uh, get into uh, the Halazi lab. So you finished your PhD, you moved to St. Louis to Washington University to do your postdoc. Yeah. Tell me a bit about the research that you did during your postdoctoral days. Yeah. Well, I was there for three years, and uh, the reason why I uh, wanted to go there was that I read a, a, a manuscript in 1967 from uh, John Halazi who was at that time a very young uh, uh, doctor in the Department of Prevent Preventive Medicine at the Washington University. Dr. Halazi was one of the first to demonstrate that high intensity running of rodents induced the biogenesis of mitochondria, which carries the oxygen to all the organs of humans and animals. And so at that time, uh, uh, this paper blew me away, and I said, that's the place that I think I can learn the most. And therefore, I was lucky, and then I got to my PhD there. And when I got there, I learned that none of the topics were focusing on the different motor units that I mentioned before in both the heart and the skeletal muscles. Therefore, my, my first study assessed the effects of endurance training on the biochemical properties of different fiber types of motor units in the skeletal muscles of rodents. In addition to histochemical analyses, we uh, performed across different uh, the uh, the fiber types. We assessed the capacity of to metabolize different substrates such as pyruvate and long chain fatty acids, acids, along with quantifying the uh, markers of the oxidative e e enzymes while the histochemistry was uh, similar to what was presented in other studies, the biochemical assessments of muscle homogenates showed that all three muscles doubled in their respective oxidative capacities to metabolize all the substrates and increase cytochrome C and citrate synthase and so forth and hence, the upshot of this study demonstrated that all types of skeletal muscle motor units have the ability to increase their respective oxidative capacity. The dogma prior to this time hypothesized that just the low oxidative motor units could increase their metabolic capacity. So changed the whole framework that that paper in 1973. Also there, we uh, did studies uh, that demonstrated that the divergent muscle types differently expressed the geo, geolytic enzymes. These particular enzymes were affected differently 
by chronic endurance running such that the slow motor units increase their glycolytic capacity while the opposite happened to the fat, fast white and fast red types. These collective findings demonstrated a pattern of ad adaptation at that time that uh, endurance exercise trained in skeletal muscle took on the properties to that of the cardiac muscle, which represents the epitome of endurance. So conditioning like that, these findings suggest that human elite ath marathon athletes also induce the same alterations as demonstrated by our marathon runners. So what's good for the animals that we were finding is good for the humans. Uh, another thing that was important in the, uh, in the Halazi lab was uh, what happens when you train animals over 10 weeks so that they are highly fit for uh, marathons and so forth. Uh, we did two studies where we had individuals, individual groups, and we would run them till they hit the wall, so to speak, where they, they just couldn't run anymore. Then we took biopsies from all of their muscles, took blood, and we also um, took uh, biopsies from the liver. And the reason why we chose the liver was because the liver basically holds most of the glycogen that is there. And then when, when people are running the marathon, when they're uh, starting to uh, lose glycogen uh, in the muscles and so forth, the uh, liver was, puts more uh, glycogen into the, uh, the, the blood supply and then uh, what we found uh, during those studies was that when the uh, animals lost all their liver glycogen, that's when they quit. And that's the mechanism, we think, for people when they're running marathons hit the wall when they can't continue anymore. No glycogen. So that was uh, one, of, uh, one of my favorite uh, findings uh, in, in the uh, Halazi lab. So obviously you did a lot of interesting work during the postdoctoral training at Washington University. And from WashU, you then took a job in the Department of Physiology at the University of California at Irvine. Yeah. And during this time period, you developed somewhere along the way this interest in the impact of microgravity on muscle properties. Can you tell us a little bit about how that interest developed and that line of inquiry? Yeah. Uh, uh, I was lucky uh, that I was recruited to the University of California in the School of Medicine, in the Department of Physiology, and in Physiology and Biophysics. And I, I was uh, brought in by Dr. Peter Hall, a doctor from Australia. And he recru recruited me because I was focusing on the theme that exercise is medicine when I had my framework uh, with the people at UCI. And uh, I was focusing on the theme that 
exercises medicine, which I learned from Dr. Tipton. So one of the reasons that Dr. Hall recruited me was to teach exercise physiology to the first year medical students because he felt that medical students would need to know more about exercise sciences. And at that time in history, I think I was one of the first to be recruited there and our, our, our class to the, to the freshman med students uh, was one of the earliest to, uh, to have exercise science in their uh, stuff for uh, becoming a doctor. Mm -hmm. So that was, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, an important point there. Uh, that helped me get there and to uh, get going. And so, uh, in that time of, of the history there, I was also uh, becoming interested in my first few years, uh, my first two years, I, I should say, I got lucky. I got two grants from the NIH, one from the Heart, Blood, and Lung Institute, and the other was focused on uh, skeletal muscle motor units in different muscles funded by the National Institute of Arthritis. So I had two grants there. And long story short, I kept those grants till I retired. And at that time, I really became interested in the science of artificial gravity and what gravity was all about because the national uh, NASA was interested in find, funding grants focusing on studies impacting the health of humans and animals when they are in space. And so uh, before uh, I sent in a grant to uh, NASA, I took animals and I lifted their tails and put them in cages so that they could walk around without any uh, uh, stress on their muscles, but their hands were, and, and we put them there 24-7, they could eat and so forth, and then we took animals over time, and what we showed was within five days, they were losing their Modi units. They were getting atrophy and so forth, and so we put that out, and I said, I, said, I have a, a, a theory now that if NASA starts putting people into space and animals into space, they need to have something to overcome when they are, to maintain, to help them exercise and maintain gravity. And so that's where we started looking to put a, a device of a artificial, uh, unit where you could spin like on a bicycle and you could spin people around and you could get them up to about six G's. And so I started sending uh, grants to uh, NASA and I was getting a lot of studies. I got a lot of studies done from them. And uh, I owe a lot to the, the fact that uh, we uh, did a lot, and one of my uh, uh, most interesting uh, studies was uh, the NeuroLab uh, project, where they were putting humans and uh, animals into space for, for 16 days. That was a lot at that time. And what we predicted was that if you took 
animals, young animals, r rodents. We knew in our stuff, in my early uh, studies at UCI, that within 35 days, the animals would come to their adult framework. And so what we did for that mission in space, we took six-day-old animals and 14-day-old animals and put them into space with their dams so that they would have nourishment and so forth. And uh, my thesis was that these animals would not fare well. And uh, I proved that with two uh, manuscripts uh, that I published in one of the uh, papers for where we are right now speaking about. And in that, what we found was that most of the young animals didn't make it. The, young, the ones that were a little older, they made it all right, but their hearts were smaller and all of their skeletal muscle systems were uh, atrophy. Actually, some of them, they basically lost uh, what they had, uh, especially to the ground gro groups that we had to match them against so forth. So that really put me on the map there with this uh, NeuroLab uh, project and it was one of the, uh, the things that really uh, uh, because of what I was doing in the sciences, I started to do it into a lot of their uh, programs there, and I did a lot there. And we'll talk about that down the road. Well, clearly, your work was pioneering in the early days of high. It was going to go on. And they, if I didn't bring it up then, they would have never uh, thought about it. The third person who has had a big impact on my career was Dr. John Halazi, who retired last year. Dr. Halazi is one of the most brilliant scientists that I have interacted with over the years. He knew his theory on many topics. He was a great, great writer but his strength was not in the laboratory. <laughs> Nevertheless, I learned a lot in his laboratory, especially molecular biology and physiology. However, what I learned the most was that I would never follow in his steps concerning the many topics that he was fo focusing on because I could not beat him. Because he had so many postdocs at the same time. I was number three out of about 112 postdocs in his factory. In my uh, last year, uh, I asked Dr. Halazi if I could do a study as to how myosin and actin, the two molecules that make up the motor that enables one to know how the muscle genes are affected by different types of aerobic exercise. He allowed me to do the, a simple study on that topic and we published it in 1975. From that point on, all my research studies have been on the molecular biology and the interactions of omics genomic epigenetic studies concerning the myosin heavy chain family. Therefore, the three stints under the years under Halazi was the real catalyst for me recruited to the UC campus and spanning from 1973 to the present. The, first per the fourth person who had a big impact on my career was Dr. Walter Henry, 
a cardiologist in echocardiography who was the dean of the UCI School of Medicine from 1989 to 96. Jo Dr. Henry was an outstanding clinician in cardiology. He was recruited because he had a vision to build out all of the programs in this young medical school and its hospital five miles away from the Irvine campus in Anaheim. I met him when we were on the California Association Review Committee for Basic and Applied Research from 1978 to 1988. Therefore, he knew my background and the fact that I was a good scientist with many grants so that I would be a logical person to become the Senior Associate Dean of Academic Affairs. I accepted the job, and my primary duties were to oversee all the faculty being recruited in the School of Medicine and their promotions. Also, overseeing the space of all the laboratories in the School of Medicine. One of my first assignments was to, uh, to put together an academic committee for recruiting new faculty. Therefore, I recruited the best scientists in each of the departments in the School of Medicine. Therefore, when any department was, were to uh, recruit a new faculty candidate, that person was vetted through that committee so that only the best candidates would be recommended to the UCI campus committee for accepting new faculty. So, that was a big hit, and many of the other uh, on the main campus started to follow that uh, framework of mine. I truly learned a lot over my years with Dr. Henry because his wisdom helped me when I was on so many uh, national academies for the NIH, NASA, and the National Academy of Sciences dur during my career. So I learned a lot through him saying, what would Walt do if he was faced with this issue? So I was indebted to him. So, Ken, you've had really many, many outstanding publications in your career, well over 230. But in your view, what are some of your most important contributions to physiology? Well, I mentioned before the dogma at the time was that only the slow oxidative glycolytic uh, units would induce more mitochondria in the muscles of the trained muscles that we did. And my findings showed that all three types of motor units doubled their mitochondria in the trained muscle. This project catalyzed so many other manuscripts from other exercise scientists. So I thought this uh, AJP 22, 373 to 378 in 1972 was one that a lot of people then started uh, doing uh, what we were doing as well. And so I'm really indebted to that. Also, in 1973, uh, in, the, in the lab, the, the thing with the, uh, the, the, the critical thing about uh, what's happening to the uh, liver and all that, I thought that was one of my uh, better findings as well because we found out that all of the animals had low glycogen in their muscles, but the liver content of glycogen was almost gone. So we found that the uh, blood of the carbohydrates was so low, we speculated that uh, our marathon rats were very low in their blood carbos because the glycogen in the liver were in a storage bin for sending carbohydrates to the muscles uh, for pr providing fuel to, to the individual. Therefore, we discovered, we think, 
and predicted that in humans running a, run, a marathon, they will hit the wall and stop running because they are experiencing very low glycogen in their levers. And so that was uh, another uh, thing that was uh, I mentioned the neural lab earlier, and uh, that put me on the map uh, for what was going on in, uh, with NASA and so forth, and how it uh, catalyzed me to uh, move uh, uh, to other things in, the, in that uh, framework of uh, sciences and so forth. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, finish in, in terms of what I, um, my, my research here, and, and I, I want to uh, push it in, in this way. Ken Baldwin, since he arrived at UCI and his PhD students and postdocs have primarily focused on the myosin family, heavy chain uh, gene family of motor proteins as the marker genes that we uh, studied. Consequently, our research has gradually evolved to the molecular biology, physiological field. For example, in recent years, we have made important findings suggesting that the fast MHC genes are transcriptionally regulated as a gene loci in which they communicate with one another through expressions of non-coding antisense RNA regulated by the intergenetic promoters. This has been via new programs and aims in the theme of genomics and epigenetics interaction, and I think this is where everything in science is going now. And uh, one of the uh, things that I didn't mention in here was that one of my honors was that to, uh, at that time in NASA, they do every decade a, uh, st studies of what NASA must be doing to move forward and right now, their big thing is trying to go to Mars in 3033. And it's, it's this type of, uh, these types of studies that are important for that, for, for all sciences. Because uh, our group put together a bed rest study for four months in bed and they never got out of bed and at that time they had two groups that was in bed that were in bed at the same time but they had two hours of uh, exercise using there were two groups one that were, were using one of our devices which was a, um, a flywheel where you could use aerobic exercise and resistance exercise while they were lying on that bench there. And uh, what they found was that the group, the second group, were using all of the heavy units that they're on ISS, where they have these big, big um, units for doing resistance exercise. And at the end of the day, our small device was as good as the big devices for maintaining the health of those individuals over those four, four months. So uh, right now, uh, I'm trying to uh, push uh, the National Academy of Sciences to think more about artificial gravity now as well. So uh, those are the things that have really uh, 
put me on the map, I think, both for NASA as well as what I've accomplished for the NIH as well. So clearly, Ken, you've had an amazing research career, but service has also been a hallmark of your career. Can you spend just a few minutes to tell me a little bit about uh, how you feel the importance of services to uh, an academic's career and some of your experiences with serving the APS? Well, uh, I really uh, did a lot, I think, along with you because we like the APS. It's a fantastic society. And some of my contributions to APS was that I published 160 manuscripts in their society journeys that I think they're the best around for sending your uh, studies and so forth. I was honored as becoming an early APS fellow. I served on the APS Animal Welfare Committee for, from 1900 to 1993. I served on the AP section on environmental and exercise physiology section that, and was the chair for 2001 to 2004. I also won the honor award for that section in, nine, in 2006. So I did a lot for the, uh, that section of uh, EEP. I served as the representative to FASIV consensus for federal funding of biomedical research. And I did that for 1996 for the uh, APS and was the chair of the subcommittee review for NASA for 1997 to 1999, and I was pushing for the budgets for NASA uh, from, uh, from the FASA consensus. So uh, uh, I thought that was one of the uh, big uh, highlights of, uh, for this uh, APS stuff. I was on it as a member of the APS Council in 2010 to 2013, and I thought I brought a lot to that uh, uh, impact. And then I won the um, APS Edward Adolph Award for the en Environmental and Exercise Physiology Lecture, which was a, a big, uh, big thing at, at that time, as you well know. So uh, I'm indebted to uh, the APS big time. So Ken, let's shift gears for just a moment. I'd like you to reflect a bit and tell me about your first attendance at an APS meeting and contrast that to today's meetings. Well, I started going to meetings when I hit Iowa. Tipton took us to both the ACSM and the APS whenever he had enough money to do us. And I learned that that's what I did. And I, as soon as I had enough money in my wallet, I joined both of those uh, societies. So at my first meeting, the APS, I was blown away with all of the big shots attending along with the tip Tipton there because Tipton knew everybody and so when I'm tagging around with Tipton I learn all about Phil Golnick, Bank Saltine, Loring Rowell, John Halazi. Uh, at that time I uh, already uh, knew John but uh, he was uh, one of the bigs there. Jerry Mitchell, the, uh, another uh, great guy too. All of these guys they were the ones that had pushed things together and that's where the young people like us at that time could learn a lot from uh, just mingling with these people and going to their presentations and uh, all the things that they were doing there. Thereafter, I knew that the APS meeting was the place for learning 
what is hot in the exercise sciences. Therefore, if we move to the present, I think that the APS has broadened its framework by putting on so many events that focus on the students and the young scientists that will be the leaders for the future. If one looks at the topics and themes for our meeting in San Diego in April 2018, you will know what I'm talking about. So that's that. So, Ken, I look down the list of academic and research awards that you've received in your career, and we certainly don't have time to talk about them all. Yeah. But would you take just a few minutes to tell us about some of those awards that have meant the most to you personally? Yeah. Well, over the years of my long career as professor of physiology and biophysics and dean in the School of Medicine at UCI from 1973 to present, I have received several honors from NASA, the National Academy of Sciences, the American College of Sports Medicine Society, and of course, the American Physiological Society. I was honored with about 20 accolades concerning research and service to the many committees uh, and projects that I contributed over the years for NASA. However, three of them were very special. The highest honor that you can get from uh, NASA is what is called the NASA Life and Biomedical Science Advisory Subcommittee. I was on that, I chaired that from 1992 to 2000, and then I won the NASA Public Service Medal for Research in 1999, and then uh, the NASA Public Service Medal for Contributions to the Administrator, Sean O'Keefe, in 2001. The latter two represents the highest awards, as I said before, for NASA. Concerning the National Academy of Sciences, I chaired the Animal and Human Biology Chapter Task Force Decadal Study, which took, uh, took me over two years to put all of it together with my team there for the, Na the NASA Life Sciences research in the next decade, and that was from 2010 to 2020 and this was sponsored by the Space Studies Board of the National Academy of Sciences. Based on the above, I was recruited to the National Academy of Sciences Committee on Biological and Physical Sciences in Space from two, for 2014 to 2020. This committee will oversee the NASA mission to go to the moon and onward to Mars in the 2030s. So, uh, I'm indebted to the National Academy there. As for ACSM on his ACSM uh, cited me with a research with a research and achievement in the exercise sciences in 1993. The ACSM Southwest Chapter Honor Award for Research and Achievements in the Exercise Sciences. The ACSM Golnick Lecture Award in 2007, and then the ACSM Honor Award in 1911. And I know that one of these days that you are going to get that <laughs> honor. You should have gotten it the first time, <laughs> and I'm pissed. <laughs> APS. APS Edward Lecture Series of Environmental and Exercise Physiology. The APS section of Environmental and Exercise Physiology. Uh, I, I got a no honor from them. And uh, I'm really. I don't know how to say it, but I, I'm, I'm really on for how people have 
given me uh, these honors. Ken, you've been very patient, but there are two more questions I'd like to ask you before we end today. Mm -hmm. And the next to the last question is, what role has the APS and other scientific societies played in your career? The, there were three science, scientific scientists, so, so, societies, excuse me, I'm getting a little bit of Lulu here, that I belonged during my career. The American Physiological Society, the American College of Sports Medicine, and the Physiological Society in London, which we teamed up uh, uh, for several years there. Uh, the American College of Sports Medicine and the Physiological Society of London, I just said that, throughout my career, I attended both the APS and the ACSM meetings because they were the best societies to learn about what was happening over the years concerning the exercise sciences. Also, when those two societies teamed up for presenting hot topics, they drew audiences from all over the world because their topics were so fantastic. In my later years, I was shocked when the Physiological Society in London re recruited me to be on their board for the oldest physiological journal. I could not refuse. It turned out that Scott Powers and I for overseeing manuscripts concerning the exercise sciences for this journal. It was a pleasure working with you, Scott. So. so, Ken, one last question. What advice would you give to students today that want to embark upon a career in science? Well, first of all, I would only advise students who were interested in the various fields of the exercise sciences, so I'm focusing on there. That said, I would suggest that one should research only the best colleges and universities. For example, I suggest a few good places as we speak right now, such as the University of Florida, Gainesville, Ball State University, in Muncie, Indiana, and the University of Michigan, to name a few, because of their strong faculty. And I think faculty is what makes any program excel. I would suggest that they check out the faculty of those places and contact them as to what they are studying and if they have grants. <laughs> if one finds a place to go to, work hard from the first day, and then join some of the societies that I mentioned above. And learn as much as you can be concerning the hot topics for your research, etc. Work hard and get your PhD, and then start looking for a postdoc, because what you accomplish in your research during that time will set you up for being recruited to a great job in a university such as the University of California, Irvine. That's the way Ken Baldwin did it. Ken, I want to thank you for participating in the Society's Living History Program. It's truly been my pleasure and honor to have a chance to talk with you today. Thank you very much. And thank you for being by my side. Great job, my friend. Thank you.